uh, a day and then play around with it and there's actually a night. So I wanted to be able to put a point light in there and say, I don't want this point light to be bouncing. So the whole system is, you can, you can break it if you want and do whatever you want with it. It's not like oh, super automatic. So here I'll put the point light in there and it's actually not bouncing. But I can click on it and say, yeah, I want this light to bounce. I can also tell the point light to, I, in the foot rendering it's going to be green, but I want you to bounce orange with it, so I can do that too. Everything is disconnected. The same thing is with the sky that I showed you before. This visible visual representation, the coders went like, okay, we can just try to take the sky texture and just project it. And I said, no, I don't want to do that. I want to be able to tell the lighting system that the sky is actually green, even if it's blue. Because sometimes you want to do that. You want to play around and you want to, uh, the, 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 the authority comes. I want the, this to be darker. And I said, no, the sky is blue, so I can't change it. So I want all the systems to, to be disconnected so I can tweak them by hand. That makes a really powerful system for, for doing whatever. I want it to be as data driven as possible. I don't want to have a dynamic sky that gets generated with some strange textures that I can't edit. I much rather want to load in a, a sky texture from a photograph I've made myself and just put it in there. Uh, Frostbite 1 was a system there that most of the system was dynamically created skies and everything and that wasn't that good. I want everything to be data driven. Of course that gives the artist, uh, he has to be careful of the memory and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's really good uh, in that way. So, some best, best practice of this system. Uh, when you create complex geometry, like a tree or something like a building that's broken in this way, it's a waste to do light maps for these red objects you see here. So what I do is I take these smaller objects that are connected to this house and I disconnect them and I import them as light from the geometry. So the gray, the house you see is gray here, that's light mapped lit. But these red objects here that's actually connected to this house are light from lit. And you see these green windows here, they don't need to be lit by any light probe or anything because all the surfaces, as you might know, that reflect light or are uh, uh, specular takes the light from reflection. All lights, all the reflective surfaces take the reflective light. So we don't have to bake any light maps for the windows because they only take the environment map. And we, as I said, we look at the, the sky um, uh, visibility buffer and we place the light map that's correct for that. So we have basically three systems here. We have the gray area that has the light map bit and the red that's the light map bit and the, the blue that's just the environment map bit. Another thing is that this system can be used to use static, make a static reduced map. We can at any time when we're looking at the level say, no, I want to make this a static bit. Because some of the levels we don't have that much destruction on it. And we want to save memory and we want to save performance. So I can select a bunch of houses and say, save this down as a static platform. Just, just save it down. Because there's no way, we are not updating any light probes, we're not updating any light, uh, so it's no need. So we can at any time just static bake this radius in my house. If we want to have dynamic uh, radio city rooms, we need to have as low resolution as possible because then we can update these light maps a lot faster. So here you can see a room and these cubes here is one pixel in the light map. So this is how high the light maps are. They're really low, but it looks really good anyway. We tested this a lot and increasing it and lowering it and we can't see any difference of it. So we, we have it really low. For dynamic, when we use this dynamic. We also, <coughs> we also use streaming in the Frostbite 2. So we have to select areas where we can stream out these dynamic light maps or static light maps. So we select the areas where we have the static and the, uh, where we have areas where we have these light maps basically. 
Well, so as I said, we have time lapse, so we could dynamically update the light maps. Um, we have a system that we can we can we can set the sound and move everything. And as I said before, we wanted also a really high range in our HDR. Uh, and these light maps, uh, we had to come up with a really good packing solution for these light maps. So they could take this range of actually introducing more light into the scene. And we also wanted to make a real camera, basically. So, this, uh, we have one thing that we uh, looked at the film also. They do something called color grading. Uh, this is really nice actually. What we do is we take a small texture. Or what we do first, we take a screenshot of the game basically. We throw it into Photoshop. And then we do, we do curves and colorize and whatever. The art director can sit there and play with these curves or whatever. And then I'll get these curves and everything, all the stuff he's doing in Photoshop. And I take these Photoshop things, the, the layered things, and I put that on a texture. It's a thin, small texture that we then load into the game. And exactly what the, 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 the um, the uh, art ratio done is going to be applied in the game. Very simple and works really nice. So here you can see how I like the world. How, how film like the world is to try to have as much range as possible. So this is, if you, I've, I've got a lot of films before it's been color graded. And this film looks like shit. I have like the new Batman movie in before it's color it'd be color rig, and then it looks like this. Everything is grey. Everything is grey and it's like no, nothing is white and nothing is black. But it's just close to black and really close to white. And that makes the color grading team or the lighting team for film be able to do whatever because they have the film and they can do range stuff with it. So now when I when the uh, art director takes this uh, just put this on. This is how he wants it to look. Basically. So when I'm lighting everything, it looks like this, and then the art director goes in and does this. One thing more that I was talking about was this filmic tone mapping. And what that does is to, at the beginning there, you saw a curve. So what it does is it's, it's a formula. It's not just a curve, basically. It goes in. And this is just, uh, I've put the sun to like 500%. And when you do that simplify with just textures, you get this burnt feeling. It looks like some disease on all the walls. You can't really see it, but it's like yellow, like skin color or something weird. But with this, this curve, this uh, uh, filmic tone curve that the, that the film uses, uh, it pushes down all these wrong colors. So when I put it on again, it goes back to this. So it's actually the same picture, but it just pushes down all the whites, basically. So I get this strange thing away, and then you get this filmic look. Uh, so the conclusions, uh, conclusion. So the advantages of this system. The biggest thing is the time. We win so much time. We can do so much levels and so much more work on the lighting and what we've ever done. So we can integrate a lot of the lighting. And also, as I said with this uh, uh, color cube, the art director can do the fill in Photoshop. It doesn't need to go to me and say, make it more blue. You can just go into Photoshop and just change this a bit and just save it and it's more blue in the light. So I don't, I don't have to talk to him basically that much. Uh, because otherwise he comes running back and forth to me and say, lower that light, lower this, make it more green, more red, or whatever. He can do his stuff and I don't have to care that much about what he's doing. As I said again, time. The, when we had the sign changes in my research, that was very painful. When they said we have to cut this half thing because it's not fun, we go like crap, because we don't want to do that. So they can design things at the same time. And as I said, we get one unified system. Because all these light probes, all the particles read these light probes, and all the dynamic objects and all the smaller objects reads the same system, and everything is unified. 
everything is, if you make your particles that's white, and you make your box that's white, and you make it dynamic objects that's white, it's going to be a little the same way. You don't have to tweak anything, you don't have to go and like, oh, it gets too bright or too dark or whatever. Everything gets unified. In first part one, we have a lot of different systems, like we have character lighting, we have vehicle lighting, because all the vehicles look strange, because we've done this and that. So we have different systems, so we have like a vehicle lighting guy that just sit there and tweak all the lighting for all the vehicles. Everything is unified now and that's really nice. But there are disadvantages. Uh, it is some memory, uh, it takes up memory, but compared to mirror search, it's nothing. But it is a disadvantage, it is, it is a bit of memory because in Frostbite 1 we didn't have any memory at all for these kind of things, but now we have to use that. Performance, uh, depending on how many light probes and density, how many light probes you put on the thing, uh, you get a bit of a hit from the CPU, depending on how many overdraws or point lights you have with the fur running. We can have about five or four point lights uh, going, drawing over each other, and that's quite fine on the console, but more than that, we get. <coughs> Uh, Authoring geometry, as I said there, uh, it could take some time sometimes uh, because we have to pay for these if it's a really huge thing. And some of the artists don't really understand the system yet. Uh, so we have a bit of problems with newer artists to really understand how this works. Uh, and as I said, we have this pre compute where we actually have to bake. Some. We're not just can we can't go right away. We have to pay for like 10 to 20 minutes when we put our static job in front of you. So I'll summarize everything. Uh, workflow, dynamic fast, uh, very different, so we get a bit of a problem. Every time we get something new, 